Hello, hi everyone, how are you doing? Very excited to be here with all of you today. And as uh, Jim mentioned, we're, we're gonna be uh, switching gears a little bit uh, from baking, breaking barriers and exploring the, the possibilities with space habitats and platforms and commercialization in low Earth orbit uh, to breaking STEM uh, gender barriers and women in STEM on the International Space Station. And we have an incredible session in store for you. And you know, uh, as someone who became interested in, in space at a very young age, I was working as a, a research uh, scientist in a molecular biology laboratory, uh, actually for, for many years, and having interesting experiences along the way, uh, and also in my career as, as a woman in STEM. I believe, and I think we can all agree, that accessibility to STEM education, STEM-related fields, and diversity in STEM is extremely important for the future of exploration, innovation, and scientific discovery. According to the U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics, women make up 47% of the total U.S. workforce, but are much less represented, in particular, science and engineering occupations. They comprise 39% of chemists and material scientists, 28% of environmental scientists and geoscientists, and 16% of chemical engineers, and just 12% of civil engineers. So what exactly are these barriers for women in STEM? And how can we increase awareness uh, of gender barriers uh, to STEM-related fields that, that still exist today? Looking forward, what, uh, also what are some strategies that we can consider to help mitigate and eventually, or hopefully, eliminate these challenges in the future? And also more specifically, what role can the International Space Station uh, National Laboratory play in making a positive impact on this important initiative? So today, as Jim mentioned, we're going to be discussing these areas with, uh, uh, that we just mentioned, and also we have three incredible women and STEM role models representing three generations and three different stages of their careers. And each of these women have experienced different types and varying levels of engagement with the International Space Station. They're going to share and discuss their personal experiences, inspirations, opportunities, and provide us with strategies that enable them to break through any existing gender barriers that they may have encountered along the way, pursuing their paths in STEM, and will also provide insights for us looking ahead and for the future of diversity in STEM. So uh, I would like to bring my, my guests uh, on the stage. And first, I'm going to introduce uh, Dr. Millie Hughes-Fulford. Dr. Hughes-Fulford, or Millie, is an American medical investigator, molecular biologist, and former NASA astronaut who flew aboard the NASA uh, Space Shuttle Mission 40 Space Lab Life Sciences as a payload specialist and the first woman who ventured into space as a working scientist. And also STS-40, just to let you know, to remind you, was the first space flight that included three women crew members and SLS was the first space lab mission dedicated to biomedical studies. The SLS-1 mission flew over 3.2 million miles and 146 orbits, and its crew completed over 18 ex experiments during a nine-day period, bringing back more medical data than any previous NASA flight. Dr. Hughes Fulf Fulford entered college at the age of 16 and, and earned her BS degree in chemistry and biology from Tarleton State University in 1968. She completed her doctoral degree studying plasma chemistry at Texas Women's University in 1972 and was a major in the U.S. Army Reserve Medical Corps until 1995. As the director of the Hughes Fulford Laboratory, she studies the control of lymphocyte activation with NIH and NASA grants. She was the principal investigator on a series of space hab biorack experiments. And more recently, Dr. Hughes Fulford and her team and her international colleagues published a, fe a featured article in the Journal of Leukocyte Biology showing for the first time that microgravity itself is the root cause of T cell dysfunction. In July of 2013, NASA awarded her work as a top discovery on the, on the International Space Station. So please give a warm welcome to Dr. Millie hughes Fulford to the stage. Thank you.
And as you heard uh, from her earlier this morning, in 2015, Anna Sofia Bakhirayev won the inaugural Genes in Space Innovation Challenge for her investigation of, of immune suppression, assessing whether changes in DNA can be detected on board the International Space Station. With a goal of, of examining if the environment astronauts live in affects their DNA, Anna Sophia's experiment is looking at the genetic sequence in space to see if any changes in our uh, uh, sorry genetic sequence might uh, might be related to some immune system uh, difficulties that astro uh, sorry astronauts face, and also using a mini PCR machine to make multiple copies of the DNA sequencing to understand these markers and possibly understand more about the immune system in space and to potentially keep astronauts healthier. Anna Sophia considers herself to be the girl with the box. And you'll see why in just a second. She is a recent graduate of Fox Lane High School. And her interests lie in the realms of biology, of course, and space flight. And she's already had, as you know, has had the opportunity to work in various labs, studying the genet genetic basis of both diabetes and neurological uh, disorders. Her most fulfilling research work, however, has been in the realm of astrobiology. And through her work with Mini PCR, the Genes in Space program, and having the opportunity to develop and conduct the first PCR experiment on the International Space Station, an unparalleled experience to use the orbiting lab as a student researcher, she hopes in the future to not only continue to engage and keep others engaged with research in space, but also to follow the paths of her samples to low Earth orbit and beyond. Please welcome once more to the stage, Anna Sophia Bakhirayev. And also joining us is Jan Hess. Jan is the president of the Engineered Systems segment of Teledyne Technologies Incorporated and its 1,200 employees. She also serves as president of one of the companies in the segment, Teledyne Brown Engineering Inc. And in her role as president of Engineered Systems, Jan has full responsibility for the near-term growth, profitability, and long-range strategic positioning of Teledyne Brown Engineering and three other Teledyne companies in the segment, energy systems, turbine engines, CML composites, serving the aerospace, defense, and energy markets. Jan holds a BS in business administration from Auburn University. She also holds a certificate in management from Darden Graduate School of Business Administration, University of Virginia, and has a professional designation in advanced government contracting. Jan is a public speaker to groups and organizations on the topics of successful business strategies and corporate finance, an advocate for children with learning challenges and a community volunteer. And she serves on the Huntsville Mayor's Entrepreneurship and Innovation Advisory Council on a non-for-profit non and or on for profit and non-profit boards of directors, and has been honored by various organizations for her leadership in business and the community. Please welcome Jan Hess to the stage. Hello? Okay, great. Yay! And you have your box, so you can talk about it in a second. <laughs> well, thank you so much for, for joining us uh, today. And um, with each of your incredible backgrounds and inspiring, um, or incredibly inspiring successes, I thought we could start with going back a little bit to the beginning and, and giving the audience a brief description of uh, that first moment or that first experience that led you to your, per, uh, to your pursuits in terms of STEM and your STEM paths. So I'll start with Millie. And I read that as a child, uh, that you read everything that you could find and watched all of the science fiction films in the world. And you had a belief system uh, back then in the 50s that women were, um, were equal and would go into space along with the men. And you mentioned that this drove your, uh, your career and most of your life. Uh, and then you decided when you were getting into college that that might not be the case, but I wanted you to, to give us more uh, thoughts on that and how that drove your, your career path. <laughs> it started in Mineral Wells, Texas. My father was a gadgeteer. So we moved our house when TV was available to a place that had a 300-foot hill. He then made his own cable company with another 300-foot tower on top of that so we could get Dallas and Fort Worth television because there was nothing in Mineral Wells. So I, I learned at 
an early age, around five, that we could pick up all the reruns on Saturday morning of Rocky Jones, Space Cadet, Buck Rogers, right. you know. <laughs> and so every morning my alarm would go off around five o'clock and I'd start my whole day of science fiction. And uh, a Buck Rogers had a female palette called Wilma Deering. Now, in Mineral Wells, a girl had to wear a dress all the time. Wilma Deering got to wear pants to work. And the more I watched it, I realized that I had to go into space so I didn't have to wear a dress all the time. <laughs> <laughs> that, that was at six. <laughs> then I went off to college and I started seeing that, gee, all the astronauts are men and they're fighter pilots, and so maybe I should study science, which mm -hmm. was my number two. Mm -hmm. And uh, luckily for me, long story made short, they started looking for women to fly. Mm -hmm. And I put my hat in the ring, and the rest is history. Wow. That's wonderful. And, and how, so that obviously shifted uh, your, uh, your thinking in terms of the, the path that you were thinking that you were going to, to go forward with in terms of STEM. And it was science fiction. And science fiction. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but I do think that writers really capture the future faster mm -hmm. than the general population. Mm -hmm. And I think children that do a lot of reading can mm -hmm. get an idea that maybe they do want to be scientists. And I, it, it's too bad that many public schools have cut down on the amount of STEM education. Mm -hmm. And that's something that we can all work on. Mm -hmm. And one more thing, if I had to give one person credit for my going into mm -hmm. this pathway as my father, who told me I could do anything I wanted to do. And so for your fathers, all you fathers out there, it's up to you to support your girl <laughs> and your boy. <laughs> That's great. And Anna Sophia, I, um, I read that you um, used to create your own rocket ships uh, out of cardboard <laughs> and experimented launching them in your house and uh, also backyard. And then also in the fifth grade, you isolated a DNA in a vegetable blender and I heard that that's when you uh, decided to go into biochemistry, that, that you wanted to pursue uh, biochemistry. So how did, um, was it that experience or what, what else also contributed to when you first became interested in, in science and, and space? So, okay, so I think um, actually both of the experiences you mentioned were pretty essential to me deciding, but yeah, so when I was four, I was a girl, I did have a box, it was a much less sophisticated box than this, <laughs> it was actually a cardboard box, and I would make rocket ships out of it, and I'm like, I'm going to go into space one day, and my mother felt much more comfortable with me saying that when I was four, because cardboard can't get you to space, now she's getting a little nervous, but, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so, I would try and I've always been interested in space and I loved, you know, looking at the stars and one year I painted the entire ceiling of my room with all the constellations so I wow. look up and it's like, wow, I'm almost somewhat in space. But having that experience when I was really young and getting into space, I was just a kid who said I'm going to be an astronaut when I grow up and I think like a lot of people in here just didn't stop saying it. Mm -hmm. And then in fifth grade, I really didn't like... Um, science though until fifth grade. I really liked English and then my fifth grade teacher said this really cool word to me, uh, deoxyribonucleic acid. I was like, I like that word. What is that word? <laughs> <laughs> so that's when I ended up doing as a science fair project at my school, isolating vegetable DNA in a blender. And you mm -hmm. can do it with soap and rubbing alcohol and salt and just some fruit and vegetables. Oh. You blend it all up, make a huge mess, make your parents clean up, but you have this really cool DNA strands. So <laughs> that's when I said, hey, I'm gonna be a biochemist. And since then, I've just haven't changed my mind. Everything I've done in science has only pushed me further into science. Mm. And then how I kind of, what also very much confirmed what I wanted to do was being able to have this experience with genes in space and having the experience doing science research, also doing stuff to do with space. And I was like, yes, I do enjoy this. Um, so I hope to keep doing that in the future. I can't tell you about my future because it hasn't happened yet, but I'll be trying. <laughs> so that's... I think you're on a bright path, so <laughs> on the right track. Thank you for that. And, and Jan, I wanted to ask you from, from your side, you've been at the helm of, of Teldyne Brown Engineering for, for 16 years, or almost 16 years now. 
and and you grew up um, with a pretty large large family, uh, and uh, your family pursuing business at, at an early age. So, just wanted to, to find out from you uh, how uh, how have those experiences inspired you, and uh, where, was there anything else, any other personal moments that that helped shape your your future and, and your current endeavors. So I've been, you know, with Teledyne for 16 years, but at the helm for about two years. Ah, okay. Yeah, so it's, it so seems it's like you've been at the helm a lot longer. <laughs> it, well, yeah, it, it does, but um, but it is interesting because I didn't come out of STEM, and here I am leading a right. technology company. Right. And, and it's absolutely fascinating. Mm -hmm. um, I, I study a lot, right? But but that's okay because growing up, what I learned is you work hard, right? Everything you do requires some hard work. It requires mm -hmm. discipline. Um, where did I get my passion for business? I think it goes back to, you know, growing up, I was one of nine children, um, five mm -hmm. boys, four girls. Wow. So I was six, number six. Seven, eight, and nine were triplet boys. Oh, my gosh. So there were, <laughs> I was surrounded by boys. My sister and I said there were five. My father <laughs> and my mother never put any limits on us. It was you can do it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I mean, that was the simple words they said, oh, you can do it, right? Mm -hmm. um, education was very important to both of them. Mm -hmm. And so when we sat, they sat us down when we started first grade. At that time, you didn't have to go to kindergarten. And they told us about this, this beautiful education that we were going to have and that mm -hmm. we were going to go to college one day. It was such a privilege to be able to do that, and you work hard for those things. Then my father died when I was 10, and seven of us were under the age of 16. And so it, it, we all learned how to work as a team. Um, we certainly weren't wealthy. I didn't know we were poor. We were poor. But again, no limitations on what we could do. Hmm. My mother was always, you can do it. Mm -hmm. And I was 12 years old, sitting in the kitchen doing my homework, and I saw my mother. And she, you know, did her budget every month. She was trying to cook dinner. She was trying to do other things. And I said, let me try it. So she sat down with me, kind of went through how you do it. And from that time on, I did the family budget. Wow. And started my first business uh, when I was a senior in college, the, you know, the first of the year. And I'd got my roommate and I through our last year of college. You know, everybody's kind of, most people were poor in college. And so you just learn that everything is possible. You work hard. And we were also told, one, when you take a paycheck, no matter what it's for, you have to earn it, and you always do more than you're asked. So I think that's kind of the simple recipe. Hmm. Yeah. That's fantastic. And obviously, hearing from each of your experiences, um, it's just, it's incredible. I'm also, um, uh, I mean, I experienced similar instances too from family. My, my parents did the same thing, and and from a science technology uh, perspective, uh, and it's really um, uh, really important to, to hear that, and you know, for the audience to hear that that those little moments can can mean so much uh, and make a, a big impact in the future of your of your career path and, and how you move forward. Um, so you've you've talked about how your your backgrounds and these experiences have shaped to where you are today. And I wanted to ask from the, the other side if there's any personal moments or anecdotes that you can share uh, uh, in terms of challenges. Anything that you experienced that, that might have tr tried to, to get you off that path or to try to, to, you know, to set you in a different, different trajectory. Uh, is there anything that you, you, know, you, know, you want to start? Sure, sure. I'd be glad to start. <laughs> Great. Okay, so, so I'll go back to two years ago when I was promoted to this position. Um, in, in a company that's a technology company, it's a company of engineers and scientists, you know, they looked at that and they said, well, you know, your background is, is financial and business. Mm -hmm. and, and there was really, I think, questions, right? Mm -hmm. And so I had to go out and prove myself. And, and to me, a significant moment, I, I go out and I talk to groups um, within our company and, and it's kind of like a town hall where you're updating on what's happening in the business, some of the programs we're working. And, and one of the smartest individuals in our company, one of our technologists comes up to me and he goes, you know, Jan, you've got it. You explained all those programs and you knew what you were talking about. And so that was just a great moment for me because it's recognition for mm -hmm. somebody that's on the STEM side who to, wasn't to a validate, believer at first, right? 
So it was a great compliment, and it, and it really made me feel good and said, all right, I'm doing my job here, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. But it took hard work, didn't it? Oh, my. I'm telling you, I have a doctorate in Google, let me just tell you. <laughs> <laughs> Amelia or Anna Sophia, do you want to or Anna Sophia? Um, so I think one of the most... I think satisfying times I ever kind of proved myself in a way is so in seventh grade we hadn't we had a middle school science fair and in seventh grade I did this we could do this research option so instead of doing an experiment you just learn a lot about one topic and you'd prepare a poster on it and you'd become like the local expert and I did chemicals in makeup so what are you actually wearing is your makeup slowly killing you? And <laughs> I just, just to comfort everyone out there, I know. But, and I had my whole presentation and I'm giving my presentation and this one guy comes up to me and he's like, oh, this is a good science fair project for a girl. She's like, Ooh. I was like, I was like, what? <laughs> Excuse me? It's a good science fair project for a girl? First why second what? what? And I, I just kind of looked at him and I didn't understand. And I was like, what are you talking about? And he's like, and then he points, so we had to bring in an interactive display. And I had a bunch of makeup out and I was having people sort it into what do you think is, you know, bad makeup and good makeup. And he's like, well, you just, you, you come here and you put makeup on people, right? And I was like, no, I know, I know the science of this. And, and he just looks at me and he's like, okay, and he starts asking me questions, and as a seventh grader, I'm just like, no, I know the science, and I start responding, and you see, he's slowly getting more and more like, oh, 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 she actually knows what she's talking about. Oh, no. <laughs> so that was, that was a really nice, yes, yes, it was a good science fair project for a girl, or for a boy, for everyone in that room, it was a good science fair project. Thank you, I'm proud of my seventh grade <laughs> science fair project. <laughs> I was going to say, I would love to see that data. If you can share that with us. <laughs> I was thinking the same thing. I would love to see the, which brands. Uh, <laughs> so if you could share that with us later, that would be great. <laughs> Millie, were you going to mention something? I, I think uh, your anecdote is very uh, appropriate because during my beginning, the, there was a lot of resistance to women going into science. Sure. I... I had uh, gone to a job interview after my PhD, and I it was through TI, and um, hmm. they liked me, and the head of HR let me look at my references, and I had two glowing ones and one very, very bad one from the chairman of my department. So it took me 50 minutes to get back to the chairman's office. <laughs> I walked past his secretary, I sat down in front of him, and I said, why did you say I was not aggressive? Why did you say? And he looked at me and he says, well, you know, you're taking a job away from a man. Wow. Oh. And I said, right, I'm going to buy pantyhose and not support my family, right? <laughs> his veins were up on the side of his head. <laughs> and uh, I said, you shouldn't do that because you really don't know what you're saying. And I got three job offers. Three, despite the fact he gave me such horrible, horrible wow. recommendations. Wow. And, but I think he went through a paradigm when I was giving the commencement address a few years later. I was just about to <laughs> ask, what happened to this gentleman? <laughs> <laughs> and, and I was relaying this story, but there were no names. And he was sweating bullets oh, out boy. there. <laughs> As he should have been. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> So, so I think that when you hit a wall like that, you, you, you have to prove to people that you know what you're doing. Uh, you have to be steadfast in what you're doing. And hmm. you just don't give up. Mm -hmm. I have a friend that just went to Stephen Hawkins' uh, uh, Canary Island meeting. Wow. And she was impressed with him because he gave two addresses. And for him to speak, it's all through blinking of the eye to get mm -hmm. through the alphabet. So it takes a long time. And he ended his presentation, he says, no matter what happens to you, never, never give up. Mm -hmm. And I would say that to anybody. Mm -hmm. Wow, 
That's so inspiring. That's a great story too <laughs> to hear and, and validating. I was going to say, you, you've touched on a few points that I'm going to be bringing up uh, uh, in a few minutes in terms of uh, strategies and also colleagues, peers. How can we overcome some of those obstacles? And you're, you're already uh, touching on, on some of that right now. Um, uh, I wanted to, uh, to also ask if, um, uh, in terms of addressing any of these barriers, or some of the barriers that you're starting to, to allude to, what are, what are some strategies or what are some things that, that you all have personally done uh, to break down these, these barriers? Um, you know, you've, you just shared your experiences and how you overcame some of these challenges, but is there anything that you've personally done to either help somebody else or you recognize something that, that you've, uh, you're proud of to, that you'd like to share with the audience? Um, you have to call people out. It's if someone says something or does something and it's targeted at you mm -hmm. and it's and you notice that, you know, maybe someone's treating you differently because you're female, because they don't think you're qualified. You call them out on it and you say, hey, why? Why are you doing this? Mm -hmm. Like what 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 have I done wrong? And they'll a lot of times they'll try and defend themselves and they'll start stuttering and it gets down to they have to say, well, you're a girl. That's what you did wrong. And once you get them down to that, their entire argument falls apart. And often people will actually start looking at things differently. They'll apologize. But yeah, so you have to call people out. But also, don't be scared to be the only girl in a room. And I have found often I'll be, like I took a math class this year where there were 10 of us and I was the only girl in the room. Mm -hmm. And I started out feeling like, oh my goodness, I represent, I represent all females. You know, if I mess up, if I mess up, True. they're just gonna think girls can't do math. And if you go in thinking like that, you get terrified and you're more likely to mess up because you're so busy panicking about what you're going to do. And you have to just take a step back and think anyone who judges all girls on what I'm doing has something seriously wrong with them and you have to be mm. confident in yourself but do it for you and don't mm. let people make you represent an entire gender because that's absolutely ridiculous. <laughs> and just curious when you mentioned that um, in terms of the strategy to call them out, uh, was this from, call, from peers, friends? Was this from uh, teachers, from parents? I'm just curious in those instances, what, what have um, you mean who I've... Who, who have you called out? Um, definitely, definitely. <laughs> uh, definitely. Because it's actually leading to one of my other questions, so. <laughs> Fellow students, it's, I'll often get, and it'll be things, maybe they don't even realize what they're saying, but you'll often get something, like, hmm. when I went and explained, you know, oh, hey, I'm doing this sign stuff in space, it's, oh, did they choose you because you're a girl? And you're like, no. No, they chose me because I gave a presentation and they liked it, or mm -hmm. at least I hope that's why they chose me. I never got to know. But <laughs> <laughs> it's things like that from friends. It's also, you do occasionally get from teachers. There was, there was one instance where it was me and a couple of my friends were taking, were trying to take a class mm -hmm. a level up from the one we were meant to be taking. And it was me and two other boys. And it was just, it could have been coincidence, but somehow I had to sit down and take a placement test. Hmm. And they just, it was a science class, and they just walked into the class. And I ended up asking the department of, the head of department for our science department. I was like, hey, why did this happen that way? And she actually, she's like, I had no control over this. I'll go find out. And mm. so you can do it at all levels. Um, it's easier definitely to call out a friend because you're on better terms with them. But if you're polite, you can discuss it with people who are technically have more authority than you. Because if you just sit back and let it happen, then you mm -hmm. don't get anywhere. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, back during my job hunting days after my PhD, I uh, also applied to the Department of Public Safety in Texas. Now, they were oh. beginning all the new forensic sciences that we see on TV now. <laughs> and so I applied. I got a call back from the head, and he said, well, we just never take women because they can't drive a government car. Oh, oh. wow. Have times have changed. So, <laughs> and so I, I went to the dean of students, and so I'm, I'm having a little problem even getting into an interview. Wow. And she was personal friends of the governor. 
So she talked to the governor. The governor called DHP, and I got a call the next day saying, why don't you come down and take the test? So I brought another female friend with me to go take the test, and we take the test. And he said, did you cheat on this? No. <laughs> he said, we've never had a score this high. And I go, and? And he says, I still don't think you can drive a, a car in Texas, a government car. Oh, <laughs> so long story short, I ended up on the top of the short list. And I turned wow. it down because I got a better offer. <laughs> Good for you. But my friend got the job. So, wow, so I guess really? it goes back to, you know, you, you bring your friends in when you can to help them. And you have to change paradigms exactly. sometimes. And, you would, and yeah. I think I changed this guy's Absolutely. paradigm. Mm -hmm. And it's one person at a time. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of times when I go talk to schools and they say, we want to uh, uh, take our daughters to work, that type of thing, mm -hmm. I said, I will not talk unless you bring boys in too. Because I think the paradigm that the boys have is helped by seeing professional women being successful. So that's all. Hmm. Wow, that's so inspiring. <laughs> Good, and and you are. Those are the. I was gonna say that when you said to change, that you're changing the paradigm one, one moment at a time. It's exactly what I think it's also about. I mean, it's uh, there's so many different levels of, of this uh, um, as far as uh, breaking down these barriers, and and these are the, the examples that that uh, are those these moments um, that people can can take away as, as insights and strategies to help them if they ever encounter something similar. Or... And keep smiling. Oh yes, <laughs> smile and nod. <laughs> That's great. And um, so you touched on, um, when I was mentioning in terms of peers, teachers, that was actually one of the questions I had, which is, you know, for, for our uh, participants in the audience and those also um, joining us online, uh, you know, us as teachers, parents, um, uh, and also, you know, in various industries, commercial or private industry, schools, uh, and also in the space industry, how can we uh, provide any other strategies or uh, suggestions on uh, on helping to uh, to break down these uh, barriers or discrimination or judgments? Um, are there any quick or brief, um, uh, short suggestions yeah. that you can provide? I mean, I think. It key word is confidence. Mm -hmm. We have got to instill confidence. And it's not just the girls, right? Mm -hmm. It's just not females. It's males too. But, mm -hmm. but with your females, you start out, and, it, and it's really with the parents. Mm -hmm. You instill confidence, and it's simple words. You can do anything you want to do. Okay? So for all of you men out there that, that have daughters, you know, there's no guarantee that, that the knight in shining armor is going to come and take care of them. That's not there anymore, and they don't, we don't want that. Okay? You want to be able to take care of yourself and, and build your own future. So you want to give them that confidence that they can do anything that mm -hmm. they want to do. And then the, then the next piece of that is educating. Mm -hmm. So once they get into school, you want our educators to continue that confidence and, and not say, well, girls do this and, and guys do that. And I think that it's probably equal through grade school and maybe when you start to get into the seventh, eighth grade and they're starting to take higher math classes and higher science classes. And that's where we really have to put in the mm -hmm. education mm -hmm. and make everyone. And again, it's not just the girls, it's the boys too, because we don't have enough, you know, uh, students in STEM in this country, I think we all know that, but it's it's instilling that confidence that you can do it, mm -hmm. you know, and, and it's a fun thing to do. And like I say, I've been studying a lot in the last two years, and I'm, I just love it. You know, I love these new areas that I'm learning. And here, you know, I, I came out of the business sector, and it's just having that passion for it, right? And, and it really, I think it's confidence to say you can do it. It's, it's kind of simple words, mm -hmm. but you're building that. Um, I think it's also especially important to keep teachers conscious because, I mean, I know there's multiple studies have shown that, shown that even teachers who have no bias on tests will call on boys more in class. They will tolerate boys jumping up and calling out an answer while they won't tolerate it for girls. It's also, there's a belief that if you hear a girl speaking, I believe the number is 30%. If they speak 30% of the time, they're perceived as dominating the conversation. 
so there's you just have to be conscious because these are beliefs these are feelings that are ingrained instilled in us and it's not something that we choose to believe but it's something that's there so you have to stay on top of what you're doing and not just default because even if you think you're completely you know you believe in equality you think everything should be fair you are not sexist that's probably true but you probably have biases just ingrained in you from the culture we live in from the way we live so you have to stay conscious of what you're doing not just settle for I think I'm doing enough mm -hmm. that's very important also you when you're saying the culture I'm thinking of media and you know things that we're exposed to uh, growing up I mean that's it's also key how did you have any thoughts you went to add Millie or I, I just think we have to tell the children that they can do anything uh, math should not be a oh mm -hmm. dear you're taking math it should be great you're gonna love math mm -hmm. um, and and parents can really encourage like do the homework on the kitchen table so mm -hmm. everyone's together so no one's in the room playing call to combat while their parents think that they're doing their homework uh, <laughs> being good at what you do having the knowledge uh, I, I, I enjoyed the movie Martian because this guy had no Google to go to. He had, <laughs> he's a perfect example of why you need to learn everything because he survived because he knew it in his head, not because he had cheated. So, so I think the other thing is sit down with your kids and say, if you cheat on a test, you're cheating yourself because you're not getting the knowledge. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the the key point is that we have to know within ourselves that we can do things mm -hmm. and that we have the knowledge. Mm -hmm. That's great. And I think we only have a few more minutes and then we'll, we'll take some time for, uh, for a little Q&A. Uh, but first, before we transition to that, I wanted to uh, also ask, uh, based on, on your experiences uh, with engaging uh, with the International Space Station, um, how do you see the, the space station as an education platform and uh, what makes it attractive in terms of STEM uh, advocacy and uh, how do you see the, the space station playing a role uh, in terms of addressing some of these STEM uh, gender barriers and making a positive impact? I don't know if you want to each take, take that quickly and then we can um, wrap up shortly. So space is pretty undefined. We've had people on the moon. We have people in low Earth orbit, but we don't have enough people out there to have an established gender paradigm. Mm -hmm. So we have, what we're doing now is shaping the future of what space is going to look like, especially I hope to see people be people going to the moon. And as we're going out there, as we're moving further into space, we define what happens. And if we have girls doing it, that's going to be expected and that's going to set the tone for the future. So what space right now is, is it's this big question mark we're filling in. And if you fill it in with girls as well, then there's nothing they won't be able to do in the future. That's great. So I think that there's just a lot of opportunities that the ISS provides as mm -hmm. far as real-time education. You know, you can see real-time in a classroom um, what's happening on the ISF in special instances, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, you have opportunities like this where you bring children in and you expose them to this mm -hmm. and what the possibilities are. And, and that's really what it is, and it's bringing it down to their level so that you start you know, driving that interest very early on. And everything is age specific, and that's really what we need to do, but do it in a way mm -hmm. that really gets their interest, right? Because you think back to your best teachers, you know, they were the ones that really grabbed you. Mm -hmm. and made you want to be there every day. Mm -hmm. And so that's how we have to look at it in bringing you know, boys and girls more into STEM. Mm -hmm. um, I think ISS is doing a great job. I would like to see them target younger ages. I think a lot of kids, by the time they're eight, know their path. Mm -hmm. So I think the ages from five to eight, nine, are your real target audience for getting kids into STEM. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's a big piece of it. I didn't quite know exactly what I wanted to do at eight, but <laughs> but I think that's absolutely key. Is is you know the earlier that we can expose our our students, uh, the it's it's definitely make more of an impact. Uh, start the thought process. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
And I think that we, we are um, uh, demonstrating that. We are showing, you know, as we're expanding with our programs, and that's certainly uh, something that we are um, increasing in terms of, you know, different uh, curriculum or initiatives, uh, programs. So we'll be um, looking at the, the earlier, or earlier uh, younger ages as well. Uh, one of the things I wanted to mention really quick, and, and we'll turn this over to, to Q&A, is when you mentioned uh, in terms of the exploration piece, um, and if you see more girls uh, participating and having that accessibility, uh, it reminds me of, of a quote um, uh, from uh, astronaut uh, Katie Coleman. Uh, she mentioned, uh, on a, actually it was on a STEM panel that she was participating on, and she said, if you can, if you can see it, you can be it. And I think uh, it, that's always resonated with me that and it's something that certainly has impacted me as, as a young student growing up. And I saw uh, you know, female astronaut or female scientist and said, oh, I, I, can, I can be that or I can, I can do that too. So um, thank you for, for sharing your insights. And, and I'll, uh, we'll, we'll have a quick, uh, or say a few minutes for Q&A and then we can turn over for some last minute thoughts. Um, I think we have, I don't know if we have, since we have the handheld mics, I'm assuming that we're probably gonna use the the stationary mics over here, we have one over here. If anybody has any questions, don't be shy. <laughs> it's hard to see if any, uh, I, I think we have a, one I question. I have a comment. Okay. okay, great. Actually, as much as a question. Sure. Um, my name is Joan Nichols, I'm from University of Texas. And I was yay, long UT, too. yay. <laughs> Sorry, everybody. Um, but one of the comments, I do a lot of outreach. And actually, the reason that I developed a project um, that, would, that cases might consider to, to put at the space station was that when I did outreach, students wanted to know what more you could do. And I want to leave you with, with one thought about what more you can do. Women have walls put in front of them constantly. Mm -hmm. That's gonna happen for the rest of your lives regardless how old you are. Mm -hmm. But you need to be innovative and you need to create the ladders that get you around those walls when, when somebody puts one in front of you. Whether it's a person, whether it's a program, whatever limits you, you look for the workaround. And there's always gonna be something. And that's something in terms of working with students earlier and earlier. Mm -hmm. It's not about what you're gonna do when you grow up, it's what are the possibilities of what you're gonna be. And that's what needs, and I agree with Millie that it needs to be early. Mm -hmm. Thank and you that's just that. all Absolutely. I wanted to leave you with. Thank you. It's very important to mention that. Hi, yeah, another comment. Um, I think we do have to celebrate what we've achieved so far. If you look at medical school enrollment and you look at PhD programs and curriculums in STEM and life science, you know, the, the numbers are 50% in, in a lot of those cases in terms of women entering those types of fields in the college, uh, in the graduate programs and medical school. So um, huge achievements there. Um, I mean, I was a PhD student in chemistry in the early 90s and there were three women out of 25 and probably one of the most isolating times in, in my life. So we've made some great strides in, um, in that area. So I think we really have to celebrate. Where I see some of the, the newer barriers then is getting women into the leadership positions the executive positions. And I think it's where we set the bar in terms of what's an achievement, what's a, a promotion requirement, those kinds of things that are where we can really change um, how we mentor women and how we support women into those roles and where they get the visibility and things like that. And so it's, it's more of a comment, but that's where I see the new barriers. We can't obviously need to keep attracting the, the younger generation, but we've made amazing strides in that, in that area. So. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, I was gonna say that was actually one of the questions that I just didn't get time to, to mention it, but the more that we can promote and highlight uh, female participation in science and, and our achievements, that's exactly, um, I think that's part of, uh, part of the, the solution as well. I think we have um, a, a time for one more question, a quick question, and, uh, and then we'll uh, wrap up and, and turn it over to the next um, portion of the session. Uh, go ahead. I, I'm, uh, I'm not actually, have been, I haven't been in STEM all my life, it's just a recent interest. Um, however, uh, when I was, I think women in all industries mm -hmm. go through what we're talking about here. Uh, when I started my own company, uh, well actually when I was in college, I was a photography major. Most of the people there were Navy photographers. And um, when I asked a National Geographic speaker um, how many women work at National Geographic, he said none, and we'd like to keep it that way. So 
And now there's been a recent exhibit at National Geographic with all the women who actually survived there <laughs> and their stories. Hmm. I think that what, what you've shared with us are, are stories that you remember, in, in, and we all remember stories like a snapshot in our life, mm -hmm. certain details that you remember. The other person in the story might remember something different. I think these are all possible nuggets of story core moments that you have to perhaps go back to those people and see if there was a paradigm shift in their thinking and then, and then record it and see if they actually change their behavior. I mean, this is a longitudinal study kind of, but um, there's been a launch. <laughs> <laughs> but I think it would be really interesting to see um, how they change their thinking instead. Because when we hear the stories, we're seeing those people right. stuck in time. Yeah. It doesn't do them justice. They may have changed. Well, it's actually what I was asking, what happened to the gentleman uh, that told you, uh, or the, was it the chairman, the that, chairman. That, that wrote the, um, the negative. <laughs> he resigned after the commencement address. <laughs> well, see, there you go. <laughs> and then also, from your experience too, in terms of the the makeup uh, research, um, uh, if you know if you found out anything beyond that that period, if you know of any updates. I mean, I've never seen the guy again, but most people I speak to <laughs> kind of do begin to realize that the brain never will be, never has been, and definitely isn't in the Y chromosome, so people do come around. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry? Oh, we have one more? Okay, great. Okay. What advice can you give to girls like me about leadership? You can do it. <laughs> try, like, don't, don't let anything stop you, and people are going to try and stop you, and they're going to say, you're a girl, you can't do that, and you're going to look at them and say, I know what I'm doing, I am smart, I am determined, I am driven, and there have been people like me who have done things like me, and you have no idea what you're talking about. Ooh, I love that. What a great way to end the session. <laughs> That's fantastic. And on that note, I would love to thank you all for participating. You know, again, you all are, are my role models, and I think you've certainly inspired our audience um, with with your stories, your personal experiences, and some strategies and insights. And and uh, hopefully, we can we can continue the the conversation. And and I think you've you've definitely. Uh, or I was going to say, I can see some paradigm shifts already happening with <laughs> just some of the conversations, some of the nuggets that you provided. But thank you so much, and uh, really appreciate you joining us uh, today. Thank you. And